must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, F. Scott Field, and I'm joined by my co-host, Stephanie Wyrock. I have the esteemed pleasure tonight to interview a pioneer and trailblazer of the profession of physical therapy, best known as her position as analyst for ESPN. I like to think of her as the 2019 IBM Watson Fantasy Football League champion. <laughs> A hero like of mine, uh, an absolute role model. We have on the show tonight the one and only Stefania Bell. Stefania, thank you so much for taking time to join us. We're so thankful for all that you've done for the field and the profession of physical therapy. Would you mind telling our audience a little bit about your academic journey and how it led you to where you are today? Uh, well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much for having me. I, um, I'm most pleased by your introduction as fantasy football champion. So <laughs> <laughs> um, we are now on a good foot going forward for the rest of the interview. Um, but it's funny because the first thing you ask is about my academic journey after we talk about fantasy football, which is what I do for a living. <laughs> and so uh, it is very circuitous path that, that got me to where I am. But on the academic side, I'll just kind of stick with that for, for the PT academic side. I went to uh, University of Miami for my master's. I did my undergraduate at Princeton University. And I I always tell people, um, you know, my, my family was big on college as being preparation for life and not so much preparation for work. So I was a liberal arts major. I really, I had uh, spent some time in France when I was a little bit younger and I loved to read. So French literature was actually my major and I knew I wanted to go into medicine. And so I figured, you know, college would probably be the last time that I could really focus on something outside of science. Um, I was also pre-med while I was there. So my intent was to go um, become an orthopedic surgeon but it was working in the training room at Princeton and spending a lot of time with athletes and rehabbing them. I realized that the PTs and athletic trainers in the, in the training room had the relationships with their patients that I really wanted. Um, and that was much more interesting to me. So I, I changed my path to go towards physical therapy as a result. And um, so after college, I spent a year getting some additional prerequisites because at the time, schools were all over the place in terms of what they required. So you had to have a lot of different requirements. And then I went to the University of Miami, did my master's and developed an interest in manual therapy there. So um, shortly after I uh, graduated, and, and thanks to my first job at Kaiser, I was actually placed in a program with other new grads there where they took us one day a week and instead of working, we went to class all day, manual therapy um, training. And it was in conjunction with the fellowship. So I was fortunate to get that really early in my career. And that led me to the direction of wanting to go through a manual therapy fellowship. So I went through the Ola Grimsby program. And it was interesting because my exposure was to much more Maitland approach, manual therapy at Kaiser. But I moved to Kansas City because I had an opportunity to do some teaching there at KU Med. And the Ola Grimsby program had a, 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 they had a, a program that ran through Kansas City. And so I opted to do that. So I really had a background in both. And that led me back to teaching in, in manual therapy. Um, after I moved from Kansas City back to California, I ended up teaching the Kaiser Hayward program. So I taught in entry-level programs as well as uh, post-professional programs, and that's really sort of the academic thread um, 
which has nothing at all to do with fantasy football, but that, that was the academic side of my education. So I know, Stefania, that, you know, as physical therapists, we have a lot of prior life experiences that draw us to becoming a physical therapist. And it sounds like, you know, just wanting to have a relationship with your patients and the previous experience of you wanting to really connect with people in that in that Princeton athletic training room was really kind of what drew you into physical therapy, but what specifically drew you to sports specific physical therapy? You know, I think I was always a sports fan and, and even those, you know, that start at Princeton was in the training room. So the work I did was with athletes and, and I loved it and it kept me around sports and I had my own experience. I mean, I think for every PT you talk to, somebody who had an injury that led them to physical therapy and I was no different. I had, um, I had torn a tendon in my ankle and it shortened my track career and I had ankle surgery, but I was never given physical therapy to do. I mean, that was pretty rare actually at that point. It was just like take the cast off and walk um, and, you know, see you later. And because I had the experience in the training room, I knew that there was more to be done. And so it's kind of seeing that, that um, gap between patients who might have an orthopedic injury and, and weren't exposed to physical therapy and then seeing what um, rehab could do firsthand by working in the training room really kind of led me to a path of combining my love of sports and, and, uh, and rehab where I thought that there was a need. And one of the things about having the background in manual therapy that I really liked was I felt like um, – the athletes had a lot more complex injuries oftentimes than people thought. So even the, you know, why does somebody who sprains their ankle end up with repeat ankle sprains, you know, chronic sprains or things that don't resolve. And so I developed an interest in really combining um, manual therapy and sports and spine. So I actually was really interested in spine um, manual therapy. And there are a lot more athletes, you know, as anyone knows, I and mean, you guys know this and people listening know this, the, the injuries are often way more complex. So I developed a particular interest in complex cases with athletes. So people had problems that were ongoing for years because they were dominant, one side dominant for their sport and had developed all these compensations. And I'd love to figure those things out. So it was really kind of my problem solving things. I like uh, difficult cases. I like challenges. I love sports and it kept me around it. And all of it put together just sort of led me to, um, I think, that population. Yeah. Now we get to dive into the sports a little bit more. Speaking of the fantasy football background, was it a goal of yours to get on television or did it just sort of happen? <laughs> Well, it wasn't a goal early on. Like when I was in PT school, I had no clue I'd end up doing what I'm doing now. I thought it would, there was never a, a path to that. There was nobody doing it. So it wasn't like I saw it and said, oh, this is what I want to do. Um, I've always been somebody who takes a different path. I mean, people thought I was strange because I was a French major when I was pursuing medicine. So um, having people think that I have these strange concepts of how to get from point A to point B is nothing new. Yeah. And, I was an English major, so I can, he I totally hear you on that one. <laughs> well, good. I love it. You know, I, this is a big, it's one of my soapbox things. It's kind of like the kids who specialize in the sports too early. I'm like a big believer in, in, in broadening your education. But uh, besides that, I just, I started playing fantasy football once I was actually practicing physical therapy. I didn't know what it was before that. And we were in a really competitive co-ed league and people were asking me injury questions all the time. And that's how I saw that there was this need for injury information tied to fantasy football. And I, and you, combining that with the fact that I watched a lot of sports and I would see the commentators trying to describe what they saw. And, you know, I, I think nowadays the, a lot of the terminology is much more familiar to people who are uh, reporting in sports, even if they don't quite know what it means, they've heard of an ACL. Uh, and the people are a little more careful with how they describe things. But back then they'd be like, Oh my God, I don't know what happened. Like, you know, look at that. That looks terrible. And, and the thing is they wouldn't have any concept of how to describe the injury. And I thought there's really 
a place for somebody here to help educate the public on what these injuries are. And, and I was teaching, so just kind of all folded together. And when I started writing about injuries for fantasy sports, the next natural progression was to radio and then television and just sort of a series of events where things opened up. And um, I, I saw that ESPN had hired Matthew Berry to expand their department. And I had met him through some of my early fantasy sports work and uh, basically reached out to him. And he thought, you know, first of all, it was a woman who played fantasy football and there weren't very many of us at the time. And secondly, I had a, a, a niche in uh, this injury analysis, but I said that was the term that I coined. And now it's really stuck. You see a lot of people talking about injury analysis. And I, I laughed because ESPN was like, what are you when I got there? <laughs> I was like, well, I'm not really a reporter so much. I'm not breaking news. And the analysts are the ones who describe what they see when they see it. So that's me. I'm, I'm an injury analyst. And um, now there's a whole bunch of them. So <laughs> must have been something worthwhile. Yeah, and there's, you know, a ton of different avenues that we as physical therapists can go down in order to educate people. And, you know, you've had this awesome opportunity to really jump into a, onto a national stage and really educate people on injuries. You know, we've had on our show before, we've had Kelly Starrett talk about online courses and programming. We had Jill Coleman talk about fitness shows and magazine articles, and you are on television. So what types of considerations or things do you tend to take into account when you are educating the public on sports injuries on TV spots? Because like you said, people may know what it, people don't really know what an ACL does, but they know that if somebody tears their ACL, it's a bad thing. So what are some things that you kind of think about as you're educating the public on these things? So there are two, it's, it's a good question because I think number one, people think it's so easy. Like you just stand up there and you say what you know, and it's, it's really not, um, I mean, it's not digging dishes. Don't get me wrong. It's uh, it, there are much harder jobs out there than what I do, but the, the task of trying to um, come across as credible and hopefully relatively authoritative on a subject but to do it in a way that doesn't put the audience to sleep or make them change the channel, which is really important to the network. And so you don't have much time. And I think uh, as PTs, we tend to like to explain things a lot in great detail, myself included. And so coming to television was a big learning curve for me in terms of, you know, your response has got to be 30 seconds or 45 seconds or 60 seconds. So you start to learn what these time parameters are when you have a very, very short window to talk about something and you have to prioritize the information you get out. And people uh, who had, I just looked at other people who had been working in the medium for a while and they said, you know, the audience isn't gonna remember, but maybe one or two things that you say. So you have to think about what are, when they walk away, if they see you on television, what's the thing they're gonna say to somebody else about what they saw or what they heard. And that really helped me in terms of trying to think not to explain too much. Um, so sometimes at the beginning, it was tough because I'd feel like I wasn't saying much of anything or I was oversimplifying things. But you come to realize that you have to deliver the message a little differently. That's why I like, you know, podcasting when I'm able to do my podcast and I can dive deeper into a subject or a topic uh, with another expert and and spend the kind of time I'd like to spend that kind of that appeases my PT brain or even when you're doing radio you have a little bit longer in the back and forth but television is really short and so you have to think about your time frame you have to think about the one or two things you want the audience to take away and uh, for me credibility is key so because I'm talking about things at a distance I don't try to over project what I know about the situation. If I've talked to the player or I've talked to somebody who's treating the player and they have permission to speak about it, and we can relay a couple of those things. I will. Um, but in cases where I'm removed from the situation a little bit and providing analysis, 
I might provide something comparable, but I'm always referencing that, you know, it's based on the information that's been made public and then give one or two things. Um, but it's hard. I've, I've had people, you know, I've done um, little sessions like at, at conferences or, or had people try to do things in a video where I say, you've got 30 seconds to answer this question. And for, for most of us, before the, you get your main point out, 30 seconds is over. <laughs> so um, I think that's the hardest thing about trying to do something in our line of work on, on television. I also think it would be hard. Uh, I mean, I guess I don't know who your favorite teams are, but just in general, the emotions that are attached to sports, especially if it's a player that you really like or you have a little bit of emotional stake in a game. I mean, how do you get – how do you keep that out of your, out of your uh, uh, ability to communicate with an audience? It's an interesting question because there's this notion in journalism that, um, you know, if you, you cover football, for example, you can't have a team. And I think that for our reporters who are reporting news, that's, uh, they basically have to adhere to that. You know, if you're a beat writer covering, let's say, I'm just make, pulling this out of a hat the Bears. Um, you don't want to be somebody who's cheering for the team. You really have to stay objective in reporting on the team. And so uh, those reporters are very good at, at staying neutral. It's a little different in the lane in which I operate, which is that uh, we're, we're really proud of being sports fans. And I think ESPN looks at it like, hey, a lot of people who work here are sports fans. And if they weren't, they probably wouldn't be as engaged in what they do. So they celebrate, they, they allow you to celebrate that a little bit. Um, we don't wear jerseys on TV. I mean, you're not going to that extent of like um, of showing that bias. Like in our podcast, for example, everybody knows um, that I'm a, that I grew up in the Bay Area, that I'm a Bay Area sports fan, that I love the 49ers and so on and so forth. And that leads to some conversations when we get into talking about, you know, like right now it's NFL free agency and you look at what are the 49ers doing and how do you feel as a fan? And I do think that that helps uh, in terms of relatability in that context. But if I'm talking, for example, about Jimmy Garoppolo's injury and his recovery, I'm just going to stay neutral on the, on the news part of it or the analysis part of it. But if I was talking on my podcast, for example, and, you know, let's just say we were talking about his recovery and it was going really well, I wouldn't be shy about saying that I was thrilled about that because I'm a 49ers fan. I want to see him do well. So I think you just have to balance it and be, I, I think being honest about where your allegiances are is, is actually a good thing. Um, it's transparency, but, uh, when it comes to reporting the actual news or commentary around the situation, as far as the injury is concerned, I just keep that neutral. Yeah, I think that that definitely has to be very important. And, you know, I know I'm a big Cubs fan, so I am I get very caught up <laughs> in some of the things that go on in Major League Baseball. So, I mean, I can't even imagine how difficult sometimes it must be to, you know, remain neutral when you have to deliver that that part of the news. But, you know, you're an on-air personality, you're a physical therapist, and you're kind of in this interesting position of being a role model for physical therapists, and especially, I think, for women. I remember, Stefania, when you spoke at the Women in PT Summit a few years ago, and just uh, mm -hmm. being able to meet you for the first time, being able to, you know, go out with you and a bunch of other physical therapists to dinner was a, a huge honor for me. And... That's, I think, an interesting position for you to, to be, especially over the last kind of few years with uh, women in equality hitting the news so hard. So what are some of the things that you're finding that you have to navigate in the working world as somebody who women really admire? And what is some advice that you could give to women who are looking to follow in your shoes uh, working in a male-dominated industry? Wow. Well, uh loaded question. Um, <laughs> what's interesting is, you know, as somebody who gravitated towards orthopedics and sports early in my career, it was always uh, heavily male. So even though physical therapy is a profession that's been predominantly female, when you start moving into orthopedics and sports, those are the uh, areas of physical therapy that tend to 
have more men in them. So uh, between that and orthopedic surgery, which was overwhelmingly male and still to a great degree over orthopedic surgery is, although you're seeing more and more women, um, that was, that's just always been the environment that I've been accustomed to. So coming to sports media really wasn't any different. Um, uh, and I was very comfortable and I've always been comfortable working with men and women. So I never saw it as a, a problem or a challenge. And I don't think that I felt like I faced particular um, problems with discrimination or gender equality in my jobs. I just felt that I needed to always do my best no matter what job I was in. Like it was very important to me to be the best at what I did. So I didn't really see for me male, female, I just saw that I was always going to have to prove myself because you're always trying to, uh, you know, impress the people around you that you know what you're doing and you're competent and that you're capable. And with that, um, the relationships develop. So I have to say, and I, I've said this before when I've spoken publicly, if it weren't for a number of men who supported me in my work, I wouldn't have had the opportunities that I've had because it was largely men that opened the doors. So, um, you know, I, I, to me, it's not, there's, there's not a, a negative um, so much in terms of, wow, I really had to battle these men to break through this glass ceiling. It was more, uh, there, there were a number of men that did open doors for me, but I always felt like I wish there were more women who would be coming along and coming through them. I'm happy to say that I think that's changed. You know, there's more women practicing in orthopedics and sports physical therapy now than there were when I started. Um, there's certainly more women in sports media than when I got to ESPN. You know, when I got there, um, there was one little makeup room the size of a closet and there were just a couple of women. And Linda Cohn was really a pioneer at ESPN. She was somebody I looked up to a great deal. Hannah Storm came shortly after me and it was great when she came because she was so established in media and sports, but she also had done, you know, real news um, at CBS and she opened a lot of doors because she came in as a very strong uh, woman who is this big talent that they had brought into ESPN and she was just not okay with the one makeup closet. So all of a sudden we all, we had a much bigger makeup room and we had hair and makeup for everyone. I mean, this was something that we did not have before. So things like that might not seem like a big deal, but when you're on TV, having somebody who knows what they're doing to your makeup and your hair is, is a really big deal. Um, so, and now that you just see so many more women, whether it's sideline reporting, um, beat writers who cover sports for us, national sports reporters, it, they're just far more of them. And I see them all over the place at ESPN. And it's not just the on-air, obviously. It's, it's, it's the people who are in all aspects of what we do, whether it's production or, you know, on the written side, et cetera. But the number of women at the company has grown tremendously since I've been there. So I think that's just... A natural evolution. As far as being a role model, uh, you know, I'm always humbled by that because I don't, I don't think about it. I'm not necessarily conscious of that. I think that when I, when I first took the job, I thought it was important that I represented the profession well because I felt like if I failed at this job, that would be a big black eye. You know, it was, it was a great opportunity. And I was very excited to have the job, but I was really nervous when I took it at first. I didn't know how people would respond. I didn't know if they would like the fact that I was doing this. Uh, I felt that it was an important opportunity to sort of give, shine a light a bit on what knowledge PTs would have when it came to sports. Um, because I think that you know, if you ask a lot of people, when I first came to ESPN, you asked people what a physical therapist did. I don't think most of them knew, you know, and I think unless people had had PT or experienced it, they wouldn't be able to tell you. Or if they had an idea about PT, it'd be like, oh, you're those people who get people up in the hospital and walk them down the hall. And there were a lot of people who really didn't understand what PTs did or what PTs knew. And I can tell you that even in my experience walking the halls of ESPN and talking to people who will stop me and ask me questions, or I've referred so many of my coworkers to physical therapists. And I've gotten physical therapists around the country when we have anchors on the road who've been traveling and had something come up like a herniated disc and 
all of a sudden they need acute treatment and they're in another state and I've been able to link them up with someone. So uh, as they've become more familiar, sometimes through their own experiences, I think they've been more impressed by PT and that's good for me. I tell people every time I refer someone who works with me to a PT, I say, you know, I thank the PT because I say if they have a good experience, it actually helps me in my position because they look at me differently. Like, wow, you know, I, I, I'm really impressed with what a PT can do. So, um, you know, it works both ways. And I feel like I've been able to give a little spotlight in a tiny way to physical therapy. But um, I, I think also that I've, I've sent people out to physical therapists all over the country. I have the benefit of, you know, when you've been around a long time, like I have, and you've worked and lived in a few different places, you know, a lot of really good people. And that network has, has really helped me. So I don't tend to think of myself as a role model, but if every time somebody tells me that they either saw something that where they realize, oh, I had no idea PTs knew that, or I had no idea PTs did that kind of thing, you know, it, then I feel good because I feel like we're expanding um, the perspective of the audience a little bit. Well, I can assure you, you've been a role model for me. I think the way that you've handled yourself over the years and the advocacy that you've done for physical therapy has been great for, for the profession. And, you know, like I said, just can't thank you enough for all that. But similarly to the last question, what is some advice that you would kind of give physical therapists looking to get into sports injury analysis? Like for, for a new grad that's maybe interested in doing what you do, what, what's some advice you would give? So my first bit of advice would be make sure you treat patients first. I have thousands under my belt before I did it. And I'm not saying it has to be that long, like, oh, hey, I had to do this for years before I switched over. And, 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 and again, my path was not a linear one. It really came about because of a number of different circumstances. And I sort of carved out something that I thought uh, would be useful. And now that there are more people who are already doing this, it would be a nat it would be much more natural for somebody to say coming out of school, oh, you know, I think I'd like to do that um, as part of my professional career. And I think media opportunities are just way more available. I mean, social media did not exist when I started. Uh, I mean, I hate to date myself this way, but when I started writing about fantasy sports, I mean. <laughs> blogging nobody knew what that was I mean that was new and writing things that posted online people were like what like you, people did not even understand how you could read things on the internet I mean it was really that novel so obviously now everybody has an Instagram account and everybody's got a Twitter account and, and people have access to promoting anything they do media wise through social media which can be a blessing and a curse. Anybody who lives via social media understands that. But uh, I would say this. Uh, one is, if I could go back and say, I know that I'm going to be doing this job in X number of years after I practice, I would probably take a journalism class or two. I, I don't know that you have to pursue a degree in journalism, but I do think there are things to learn about it that I, I think would be helpful. Uh, I would take some, um, you know, maybe take a class that involves doing some on-air work, whether it's, you know, simple uh, social media stuff or even just, you know, again, taking through like a communications department where you can actually practice doing things that are in front of a camera or on the radio to get that experience. Because I had to learn it by trial and error and luckily <laughs> they kept me around even though I didn't know like where to look the first time I was on TV and I just figured it the camera with the red light on was probably the right one but there's so much that you don't know just about the environment until you're in it and anything you can do to make yourself more comfortable is naturally going to make you better when you're when you're on television, if you're using that or, or on camera but for any sort of social media. And uh, so I, I, I think a couple of things like that would have been really helpful for me. And I would certainly recommend it to somebody else. And I think, you know, stick with what you know, again, because the opportunities may exist earlier in your career and you may not have seen that many patients. It's, it would be easy to make some, some overreaching statements 
um, without the benefit of having a lot of patient care. And, I, and the patient care is critical. I draw, I still draw on my own experience um, quite a bit when I'm thinking of comparable cases or things that I did or philosophy of treatment, et cetera, because I, I lived through so much of that and I worked in that environment. And that honestly helped build up my resources as well. There's a number of people when I, you know, talk to people at different teams, uh, you know, whether it's physicians or PTs or athletic trainers, um, the network that I have based on my prior experience is huge and it's invaluable. And it's part of why I'm able to be um, successful at what I do is really because of the resources I have out there. And that network continues to grow. But part of the reason it grows is because those people trust you. And the trust comes from limiting the scope of what I say and what I talk about to things where I actually have good information. Um, social media is a, can be a very dangerous place because once you put something out, uh, it's there forever. And I think um, I've seen people engage in social media in a way that they might regret a little bit <laughs> further down the road. Um, you know, dogmatic arguments between <laughs> professional people where I think um, discourse is good on social media, but civil discourse is key. And I don't always see that. So, you know, things like that can really hurt you later down the road if this is a career that you want to have. So, um, you know, I, I would be thoughtful and measured in how I engaged socially but then I would, on the flip side of that, I would say use social media to your advantage. Um, podcasting, I mean, you both are doing podcasting, so you understand that world. It's a great way to be able to dialogue and have conversation and, and start to draw people in and create an audience for yourself. I've seen some very creative folks uh, with their Instagram accounts and some of the things they're posting, whether it's videos or uh, maybe they pick a topic of interest, you know, talking about a particular type of injury or certain kinds of uh, cases that have that uh, have been brought to their attention, and then they'll integrate some literature with that and create the whole um, the cool thing on an Instagram account that people could go look at, whether it's other PTs or whether it's their patients. And I've seen so many more health professionals integrating. The, basically what they do and what they believe with how they reach out to their patients, not just to their peers. And I think that's really valuable as well. So, uh, you know, it's hard to give specific advice because it's visual in terms of what people want to do. And I think the opportunity, but I would say it's not a bad idea to practice some of this stuff first before you really throw it out there. <laughs> Because once it's out there, uh, Lord knows there's no taking it back. So, yeah. no, you've you've brought up a lot of great points there, and I want to go back a little bit for for this next question here. You know, being under the bright lights of the TV studio, you know, you've done many speaking engagements and presentations throughout the years. I've been fortunate enough to to be there at a couple of them, and you know, you've done a really great job of of communicating to you know the audience and and the general public. What is some advice you would give to maybe somebody who's looking to land some of these opportunities as far as the best ways to handle the pressure of being, you know, in the spotlight, so to speak, or, you know, just giving a talk or, or, or you know, putting yourself out there? Well, I think, first of all, you have to enjoy speaking to an audience, you know, if it, if you don't like that and it terrifies you, then this is not the, not the place for you. Um, I, I really think of it as an ongoing conversation. You know, even when we're in a studio and we're talking, we're talking to the audience, we're talking to the viewer, we're, we're talking amongst ourselves, but we're talking for the benefit of the viewer. And so you always want to keep that relatability there. And I think um, the more you engage in public speaking, the easier that comes to you. Uh, and public speaking doesn't have to be on a stage with hundreds of people. I mean, it can be small presentations. I, I really benefited from all the teaching that I did. I think that prepared me immensely because I taught, in, as I said, you know, physical therapy programs, but also a post-professional program where sometimes there would be six or eight fellows in the room and that's it, you know, a small group. Um, but a really bright group and you have to be able to engage and interact and respond and, and that environment 
uh, really pre prepped me for what I do now. Um, but I think, you, you, number one, you have to like it because if you don't like that getting up in front of an audience and speaking, then this is not the path for you. That being said, I'm assuming the people who would want to get into it do like that. And I think um, that goes back to the relatability. Not you, you want to engage with the audience as if you're having a back and forth and not talk down to them. And that's a big part of television too is – You've got to make it like you, you're sharing things that you think like, hey, this would be really interesting. Don't you find this interesting as opposed to, you know, let me tell you everything I know that you know nothing about <laughs> um, because of it, nobody wants to be spoken to that way. I mean, it sounds silly, but I think those are the differences between people who have an ability to relate to the audience and, and those who don't. And it's funny, when I first got into uh, the line of work I'm in now, I just, you know, I'd pick out certain anchors who I thought were really good at what they did. Just looked so natural on air. And and I'd pick their brain about these kind of things all the time. And they would say, you know, likability and relatability are a big part of having success in this job. So, um, you know, you just don't want to seem like you're talking down to people. You really want to seem like you're having a conversation, like you could be sitting in the living room talking to them. Uh, but at the same time, you still have to really know your subject matter. So if you get up and you try to talk about things you don't know about, you will be exposed. It's better to stick with a very small amount of material that you know really well than to try and speak about volumes of things where you're getting out of your comfort zone uh, because then that, that, that puts you in a bad spot. So I think those are the kinds of things I would generally recommend. Um, but I think it's also reps, you know, that's what we say in the business. The more you do it, the more comfortable you get. So if you want to be involved in, in, in the media or those kind of opportunities, you just need to get more and more reps doing it. And the audience doesn't have to be large because you're really going to speak the same way with you're talking to an audience of several hundred or an audience of five or 10. Well, Stefania, I have really enjoyed this conversation. I always enjoy hearing you speak, and I really um, have learned a lot just about how to engage with the general public. I think that that's something that we as physical therapists need to do a better job of in general is just making sure that we're informing the public about what we do and how we can improve public health. So at the end of our interview, we always ask a standardized question to all of our to all of our guests, and I'm really interested in hearing what your response would be. And that question is, if you could change one aspect of higher education in physical therapy or a healthcare provider related field, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? Well, um, for me, you know, speaking personally, I think um, as far as physical therapy education. I, I can't speak to outside of PT education, but I definitely wish there had been a little bit more uh, focus on business and administration aspects of my work. And in addition to that, advocacy, and maybe even nowadays, given that social media is so available, media. So uh, that's a lot. And I'm sure people don't want to have you know, a whole extra semester of PT school. But I felt like I was, had so much, I had such a good education. I love my, I love my time at University of Miami. I'm very, very glad that I chose to go there. But, um, you know, we had one business administration class and it just wasn't a, a focus. And I felt ill-equipped to, um, sort of handle some of the things that came my way when I decided to do some consulting. I, I did um, before I went to ESPN when I was working um, both at KU and then again in California, I did um, private consulting for performing artists. So that was also a part of my practice. And I did a lot of backstage therapy with touring productions and things of that nature. And I would hire other PTs to basically um, take shifts at, at theaters when Broadway productions were coming through, for example. And um, I also did some ergonomic consulting and things of that nature. So 
I just had to figure all that out on my own. And I would have loved to have had a little more structure in that department. I think because PTs now have so many job opportunities outside of the traditional settings. You know, when I graduated from school, I thought it was hospital based or, you know, rehab center based or outpatient clinic based. Um, and that, that felt like the choices, you know, <laughs> by and large. And, and now you see people working in so many different environments. A lot of people, a lot more creative than me have, have carved out these, um, private practice niches that, uh, that reflect that they had good business skills in addition to their phys- physical therapy skills. But for me, I felt like I was deficient in that area. And, and with that came the ability to market myself well. And we talk about this, uh, you know, you, you said, you, as we were talking, you were thinking about you know, how we have to do a better job of informing the public about who we are. And I do think the marketing aspect of what we do is something that PTs struggle with because they don't like to toot their own horn, so to speak. They tend to be um, just satisfied with helping patients, which is great. And that's what, you know, we love about them, (laughs) but it's also doesn't do you any favors when you're trying to educate the, the, the public about what you do. And so those marketing skills are really important and it's a fine balance between letting people know what physical therapy has to offer and not, being over the top about it. And I also am a big believer in collaborative care. It's been a big, big mission of mine. I've talked to people at the APTA about it um, because my big fear was that PTs would put up silos and and, uh, to to exclude other professions because we want to be the one that's getting the most market share, for example. And I I have always worked in very collaborative environments. It started in the training room when I was at Princeton and everywhere I've worked, it's been multidisciplinary. And I've liked that. I think that's, that's part of what's helped my career. So I'm very happy to see like this recent joint statement between the APTA and NATA, something that has long been overdue. And I'm thrilled when I see things like that because I think cross- collaboration is really important as part of promoting our profession. Uh, I, I think it only helps us. So more, more, of the, more of the business and administration and marketing side and with an emphasis on collaborative care. That would be my wish. Yeah, I love it. Those are some great points, Stefania. Well, thanks again so much for your time and for coming on the show. I know you're really busy these days. Where can people reach out to you if they have more questions or just kind of want to follow along with what you're up to and dominating fantasy football leagues left and right? <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll see about that. I'll stick with the the uh, the the dominating the IBM league. We won't talk <laughs> about all the all the other ones. But um, the, you know, my social media is the best way, and actually, I've I've gotten a lot of great ideas from people through social media and I pay attention to what people post there. Um, I think Twitter is a great tool despite um, some of the shortcomings of of what happens when you're on Twitter, but you can find me there at Stefania underscore ESPN. That's my Twitter handle. I'm on Instagram at Stefania B87. Uh, and certainly through Instagram, you can also communicate as well. And, and I, I'm getting better. Instagram is newer for me, but we're finding that people really love it. You know, I've, I did this talk recently on, on how to, uh, get some of the, some healthcare providers to collaborate with the media more to get comfortable with doing that. And, and, um, Instagram and numbers in terms of how people are accessing information has really just flown. And it's because people like video and they like pictures, they like images. So uh, like I said, there's some PTs who are doing really cool stuff on Instagram. And I think it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great place for us to showcase um, what we do because the, the use of video is really helpful. So Uh, I'm not as skilled as some of them on Instagram, but I am trying to find ways to share a little bit more about what I'm doing through that. So those, those are the two best places um, to reach me. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we'll put all those links up in the show notes for anybody who's interested. Stefania, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on tonight. 
Well, thank you. You both are so kind in your introductions and <laughs> make me, uh, I'm blushing. Not that you can, not that anyone can see it, but I do, I do appreciate it. And uh, thanks very much for, for hosting your podcast um, because you're doing a service by asking these questions. These are the kind of things if I was new in my career that I would have wanted to know more about. So you're doing a great service by um, talking to different folks and getting some of this information out to people who may, might be wondering about these things but don't know how to ask. So thank you. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.